I was watching this video by CodeBullet where he was trying to train a neural net to play snake by just looking at the pixels like a human would. Now this stuff is really exciting to me, as you can tell by my last few videos, but CodeBullet kind of quickly abandoned the idea of training the AI on the full image and then later abandoned the idea of using deep Q learning entirely in favor of pathfinding based techniques. Now don't get me wrong, I love CodeBullet's videos and those videos were amazing as usual, but I was still disappointed and decided that if deep reinforcement learning can play Dota in Go, then it should be able to play Snake. So I was like, fine, I will do it myself. This video is a distillation of me trying, repeatedly failing, and then somewhat succeeding and getting a neural net to play Snake perfectly on at least 6x6 and 10x10 games and training some networks that can, in theory, finish a 20x20 game as well if I had enough time and money. I'm also going to discuss why normal DQ learning is a bad choice for this problem and what some of the alternatives are and where we can go next to beat larger games of Snake in this fashion without needing insane computing power. Now, if you're only interested in watching the AI train with some nice copyright-free music in the background, skip to the timestamp shown now. So let's go. Things started pretty easy. I coded a game of Snake in a live stream, link in the description, and I was like, hey, half of the work done, right? <sighs> Little did I know then. Now for those unfamiliar with Q-learning, I do have a few videos on the subject ranging all the way from explain like I'm one to let's code this in more detail than anyone ever asked. The broad summary of Q-learning and really all reinforcement learning algorithms is you have some environment, in our case, the game of Snake, some ability to change that environment, which for the snake would be something like going up, down, left or right, and then some consequences of causing that change, like the snake eating or dying. We can attach a reward or penalty to these actions so that if the snake eats, we're all like, you done good, son, and give him one point. But if the snake dies, we're like, get good and take one point away. In some cases, we also might slowly leech points away for every step because life is pain uh, and also to avoid loops. This reward can then be used to train the neural network by using this fancy equation that I'm showing on the screen. I'm not gonna explain this equation here. It's called the Bellman equation and you can check out my other videos for a deeper explanation. Now, if you're at all familiar with neural nets, you might be like, but neural nets need a lot of data. And you would be right. Here, take this cookie. Now to generate this data, we could just get a bunch of humans to play Snake for many hours, record all of that data and feed it to the algorithm. But uh, this video isn't called Mechanical Turk Teaches an AI Snake. It's called AI Learns to Play Snake which is where we run into our first major issue. To learn the game, you need to play it, and to play the game, you need to learn it. To get around this chicken and egg problem, we can sort of mimic human behavior. If you're new to a game and know nothing about it, you will start experimenting with it by just doing random stuff, just pushing buttons and stuff. As you do these random things and look at how the game changes, you can then come to conclusions like, oh, this makes the snake go left, or oh, if it hits the wall, it dies. After some time, you will learn the game and will mostly be playing it based on your experience. But as you get into newer and newer situations, you might still take some random moves to see what happens. Like take a chance on a new strategy. The simplest version of this in reinforcement learning is something called Epsilon Greedy. And it is the first exploration strategy that I tried with the game of Snake. You start by acting completely randomly. And then as the network trains more and more, you slowly decrease the amount of randomness and mostly follow what the network says, but sometimes pick any of the available actions. It's actually very easy to solve a 4x4 game of Snake using this approach. Uh, it's not pictured here because I'm an idiot and didn't record it, but this simple idea actually does not work well for even a 6x6 game of Snake. Here's the issue. Even if the probability of taking a random action is really, really small, like one tenth of a percent, about halfway through the game of 6x6 Snake, that's about 100 steps in, the probability of a completely random action happening at least once, note that this is very, very likely to kill the snake, is 63%. 63% likelihood that the snake will die halfway through doing something new. This only gets worse as the game progresses, and it is much, much worse for larger games of snake. Now, I don't know what Codebullet was doing exactly, but if he was using Epsilon Greedy, then the result that he got actually makes a lot of sense. Here, I'm showing an example of this technique not quite working well on a 10x10 game of snake. The best it could do was a score of about 50. Pathetic. So at this point, I decided to completely throw away deep Q learning and look for a new strategy and start from scratch. I randomly landed on this excellent video by Alex Petrenko, who's a PhD student, where he uses the advantage actor critic algorithm to solve a six by six game of Snake perfectly. The more I read about this technique, the more I liked it. Now I'm not gonna get too much into the math or implementation of A2C in this video, though I will link my code in the description and I might make a video on it in the future. The part that's important to the game of Snake is the fact that this algorithm outputs a probability distribution over all possible actions. Basically, if the snake is in this situation, the network will eventually learn that going up or right is good and give them high probabilities. And going left or down is bad because the snake will die and will output really low probabilities to reflect that. 
For exploration's sake, we can take the probability distribution and draw a sample from it. This means that most of the time we will take the options that the network currently thinks are better, but sometimes we will also take what appear to be the wrong options, which creates some semblance of exploration and creates more data for the snake to learn from. Okay, I feel like that was a lot of new stuff. Uh, let's look at this cat picture for a few seconds to decompress. All right, we good? Good. So we can apply this algorithm to a six by six game of snake and hey, it works. Woo! I mean, we knew it was going to work since Alex's example worked, but like, let me celebrate this, okay? All right, before we tackle a 10 by 10 game, I wanted to give the snake a little bit of personality. So I made some sprites for him. Oh, look at that beautiful smile. All right, don't judge me. This is the first time I'm making sprites, all right? And this is where the training montage begins. What I'm showing here are four out of 64 snakes that are running simultaneously to help the neural net learn. It's important to have many copies of snake running at the same time, otherwise the neural net might not generalize. The actions of each of these snakes are decided by sampling the probability distribution that the neural net outputs when it's given an image of the game. Once each of these games takes 16 steps, we stop and train the neural network on all the data that they collected and then start all over again. That's why you see this periodic hitch in these images. Now, in the beginning, the network knows absolutely nothing. It doesn't even know how to see. So it actually spends a fair amount of time training the convolutional layers, which are essentially training the network's eyes. Until those layers get to some good weights, the network can't learn to do really anything. So it just keeps doing random stuff. Then comes a point when suddenly the network starts to be able to reach the fruit consistently. This is a heavy exploration phase and the snake slowly gets longer and longer. As it learns to get better and better, it's able to explore more because the probabilities become more and more disproportionate between the good and the bad outcomes. And then finally, we get to a point where the exploration is actually able to beat the game sometimes. Yay! Now this is great, but it doesn't quite mean that we're done. We're on the right track though. So after the snake was able to win repeatedly during exploration, I decided to stop the experiment and run some tests. Now this network does a really good job of winning the game most of the time, but it can still get itself stuck. So it could have used a little bit more training. So if this was so easily done on a 10 by 10 game, then a 20 by 20 game should be easy, right? It's the same principle, right? Wrong. I started training a similar network on a 20 by 20 game where 10 by 10 started to win after about four hours. I had to stop the 20 by 20 games training after 18 hours because it was improving really, really slowly. By this point, the neural net can play the game competently up to a score of about 80. And by now I'm so tired of trying to get Snake to work is that I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a win. I'm taking that as a win. I estimated that if I left the training running for about eight days, it might've gotten close to the max score of 400, but I didn't want to commit my desktop for that. So I, I stopped. I also did a fun experiment with a 40 by 40 game, trying a method where the number of available fruits starts out really high and then slowly decreases to one. I was doing this in order to fight what's called the sparse reward problem. So you have to help the snake out a little bit in the beginning and then you can slowly stop helping it. This was actually working quite okay and it was able to reach a score of about 100. And it looked really fun while training, but again, it was not improving above that at all. So why does this happen? Why does the 20 by 20 game seem to take so colossally longer to train? I think there's two reasons for that. One of them is that 20 by 20 isn't really twice as complicated as 10 by 10. I wouldn't even say that it's four times as complicated. It's probably much more complicated than that. The amount of possibilities just become really, really large. The second issue has to do with data inefficiency of the algorithm that I chose, A2C, and how we can't reasonably train on longer games altogether, and instead each training step only considers a few moves, in this case, 16. When your average game can have tens of thousands of moves, 16 is a very, very small number. Now there's two possible ways to fix this, which I'll try the next time I get the courage to train Snake. Uh, I've been at this for over a month now, so it kind of burnt me out. There's an algorithm called Proximal Policy Optimization, or PPO, which can get around the single training step issue. And we can take training data from full games, including all later stages in a single batch of updates. The PPO algorithm often is able to converge much faster than A2C and is one of the de facto algorithms used these days for reinforcement learning. If you've ever seen that OpenAI hide and seek video, that was trained using PPO. 
The other solution is to use a model. So far, all the algorithms that I've described are what's considered model-free. Snake is a pretty simple game, so we can either get another neural network to learn what the next few frames are going to look like and use that to make a better decision, or go the route that AlphaGo went and run a bunch of copies of the game for future steps before making a decision about the current step. I think the second approach is gonna be a better solution, but I guess we'll find out. All right, if you made it all the way to the end, and even if you didn't, thank you so much for watching. This video is a different style than my normal videos. Please leave a comment telling me what you thought of it, and remember to leave a like and subscribe to my channel. The next reinforcement learning video will probably be about teaching a robot to dock itself, and until then, I'll have a few programming-related videos coming as well. See you next time. Bye!